quiz at least five to six questions. That is what we are aiming for. Uh, there would also be some questions uh, online. So we will take them up as well if we can. But uh, priority would of course be with you guys. So ask as many questions as you want. Of course filter them through your minds. Then ask. That will help Irma very much. So just be careful. You guys know the rest. So right. Okay. So that will be the flow of it. Uh, Chief guest will be here in yes three to four minutes, and then we'll start. So that's fine. Okay. It gives me great pleasure in welcoming you to the Shiksha Arambh Vyakhyan 2022. We are fortunate to have here with us today Dr. Ashok Dalwai, IS, Chief Executive Officer, National Rainfed Area Authority, Department of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, Government of India. He is here to deliver as the Chief Guest for the Shiksha Arambh Vyakhyan 2022. May I please have a round of applause for him. I now invite Dr. Umakan Dash and Professor Pratik Modi to please escort Dr. Ashok Dalvai to the stage. I request Dr. Umakan Dash, Director Irma, to welcome and felicitate Dr. Dalwai. Thank you, sir. I now invite Dr. Uma Kandash, Director Irma, to the dais. Sir. Uh, a very good afternoon. Uh, I can see anxious faces to listen to our chief guest today. Uh, I welcome you all to the Siksha Aram Vyakshan 2022 for the incoming 43rd batch of IRMA flagship program PGDRM RM. On behalf of uh, Sri Dilip Prath, Chairman IRMA, the governing board, board of IRMA, my faculty colleagues and the entire IRMA community, I welcome our esteemed speaker Dr. Asok Dalwai, IAS, Chief Executive Officer, National Rainfed Area Authority, Department of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, Government of India. We are immensely fortunate and grateful to Dr. Dalwai that he agreed to be our guest and deliver the Siksya Aram Vyakshan 2022 in spite of his busy schedule. Dr. Varghese Kurian established Sarma in 1979. His professional management and governance were the key contributors for the success of the flood uh, white revolution. And Irma was set up to replicate these skills for the vulnerable section of the society. Doing so requires, of course, utmost commitment, perseverance, and dedication. As we continue to celebrate Dr. Kurian's centenary, it is a matter of pride that Irma's commitment to serving the underserved has manifested itself in nearly 4,000 professionals across three programs who continue to realize his vision and dreams of better India today. We have a vibrant and extremely talented pool of aspirants from across the country who are now part of the program as participants. And we are sure that their achievements in the future as flag bearers of uh, this institute 
will sign brighter light for Irma. The six-year RM Vyakshan is the commencement address for the incoming batch of Irma flagship programs candidates. It is delivered by an eminent personality to inspire the young minds entering the program. Since society is well integrated into the curriculum of the course at Irma, we want our participants to be motivated by a person of eminence as they gear up for their important journey in their lives. Our eminent speaker for today is Dr. Asok Dalwai. Dr. Dalwai has had an illustrious career in development administration where he has implemented several reforms in the rural agrarian sector in the state of Orissa and Karnataka. In his capacity as a district collector, both in states of Odisha and Karnataka, he has applied his deep knowledge of the agriculture sector. As a key member of the Bangalore Agenda Task Force, Dr. Dalwai envisioned and implemented several infrastructure projects that transformed the city into Silicon Valley and Garden City of India. He was responsible for introducing the self-assessment scheme for property taxation, which was hailed as a modern in urban administration all over the country. Dr. Dalwai has held several important positions in the state government like Secretary of the Commerce and Industries Department, Government of Karnataka, Principal Secretary, Industries Department, and Principal Secretary, Steel and Mines, Odisha. He has been the Chairman of the various corporations, including the Odisha Mining Corporation, Industrial Development Corporation of Odisha, Industrial Infrastructure Development Corporation, Industry Promotion and Investment Corporation of Odisha. During his tenure, Dr. Dalwai has introduced modern management principles and re-energize the corporate into customer-focused organizations. He served as the Deputy Director General of UIDAI. In his capacity, he was the head of the Technology Center, which was responsible for the developing and deploying state-of-the-art technology for biometric enrollment and deduplication. He plays an important role in the Millet mission and to make India the Millet hub of the world. He was part, also part of the effort made, which uh, was supported by 72 countries and U United Nations General Assembly getting declared 2023 as International Year of Millet. His work as the chairman of the Committee on Doubling of Farmers' Income stands tall as milestone in the modern times. Once again, I thank Dr. Dalwai for accepting our invitation. I am confident that his words will ring loud in the hearts and minds of all those in attendance. I now invite Dr. Dalwai to deliver his speech. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Chairman of this prestigious Institute of Rural Management, Anand, and my senior colleague, Srirath, Director of the Institute, Dr. Markan Dash, Chairman. PG program, Dr. Pradeep Modi, all the respected Board of Governors, Dr. Supekar, Dr. Karamkar, all the respected staff of this institute, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and the young boys and girls. Once again, good afternoon to everyone. I'm aware that in addition to all of you assembled under this roof, we also have people on the virtual platform. So hope all of us over the next hour make sense of the time that we have been asked to share. And these moments that we have been offered to share is destined. It's my privilege to be here at Anand once again. And I'm aware that I'm in a special place. It's a Punya Bhumi. So I feel myself charged, inspired, and motivated. 
So I would like to thank you personally, Dr. Dash, for calling me to this extraordinary place. Every soil has its unique character. And all of you, young boys and girls, have been lucky and destined to come to such a unique place. Certainly you have opted for it, but your desire to opt for it has been blessed. You are all aware that the place we are standing in is the brainchild of Dr. Vargis Kurian, one of the makers of modern rural India in particular and modern India in general. He is the one who by chance came to Anand, much against his will, but he was destined to spend his entire life here. This became his karma bhumi. And he demonstrated to the world as to what the marginal sections of the society, the women in particular, more specifically in the rural areas, could do to transform the economy of a large nation like India. And that professional commitment and unconventional leadership of Dr. Varghese Kurian was facilitated by one of the greatest sons of India, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, who also happens to be from a close by village, Karma San from here. And then it was another great Gujarati who was the former Prime Minister of India, Murarji Bhai Desai, who actually went from a village, and village to form the first five milk cooperative societies of the village. All this would not have been possible but for that selfless, committed young leader in Tribhuvan Das Patel. And finally this institute is an extension of that commitment of all these people to rural India and the rural society at large across the globe. So you'll all agree with me that you are truly in a place that is blessed. We are also in a state which has given India and the world the best of people. In the modern century, we have had Mahatma Gandhi given to this entire civilization. He is not just the father of the nation, but is somebody who is a guidepost, a lighthouse for all times to come for the world civilization. And we have had, of course, former Prime Minister Muraji Desai and the present Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi. So Gujarat must be something special that such great men and such great women take birth and contribute to changing the society. You all have extraordinary ex examples in such people. You have all obviously chosen to join this rural management while many may have opted to choose industrial management or business management. And I understand that you are a kaleidoscope of background from social sciences, physical sciences, applied sciences. So you are going to be part of that cauldron which is going to churn you and make you build new relationships. And let me begin by saying that human life is the most glorious life. It is the, obviously the highest evolved species, but there cannot be any life better than human life on earth. But 
whether you want to make it beautiful will be in your hands. And that time has just begun. Till now you are nurtured, secured, protected in the sanctuary of the love and affection and care and concern of your parents. This is the last step where you will have some connect with them in terms of protection. But the end of 22 months that you'll be here, you'll be stepping into a world of your own. So this is an opportunity that you are getting to prepare yourselves for the real life. And the real life skill sets are going to be so very different from all that you know so far. Since Dr. Varghese Kurian envisioned a set of young professionals to serve the cause of rural India, an India that Mahatma Gandhi believed as the very sacred soul of this nation, will be your play field. You have a vast play field. You must be having some idea of what rural India is. We keep reading in books and the general perception that one gets is that they are a old world charm with simplicity and their own traditional and conventional way of life. If you go with this impression, you are going to have a surprise. It would always be good in life to know the real, to face the real and handle the real. Today's rural India, after 75 years of India's independence, which we will be celebrating come August, is very different from the one that we had three decades back or four decades back. And this is borne out by just visionary impressions as also from research studies. One of the research studies that I would like to draw your attention to is a study by Professor Ramesh Chand, member of Niti Aayog. His survey showed that unlike what we commonly believe, that India and Indian rural canvas is agrarian is far from truth. Unlike 1951 when we had 80% of our people dependent on agriculture, today the profile is mixed. One third of the GDP of a rural India comes from agriculture, one third from manufacturing sector and one third from service sector. That is the changed landscape of rural India. These are approximate figures but that's the change situation. If there are such fundamental changes in the economic structure of rural India, there are also bound to be social transformations because the economy impinges upon the sociology very directly and vice versa also is true. But compounded by the transformations or radical shifts that have happened in the information and communication technology. Rural India sociologically today is as much in the churn as is the urban India. In a way rural India is at a churn which is yet to settle and the aspirations of the youth is today unmatched by any times before that. So obviously the psychologically the mindset of the rural population will be very different. So you must be prepared to face a new rural India as you step in there with what changes that you want to make. Just as rural India is changing and just as rural landscapes of many countries in the Asian and African continents are changing. The whole globe itself is changing. At the macro level, there are tectonic shifts that are happening in every domain. One of the very interesting books that I read last month is 
called the New Age, written by Arvind Chinchure. He heads the Deshpande Foundation at Hubli in Karnataka. He is one of the very simple and transparently written book. And he is talking about the four characteristics of a new age. The first one is disruptors. The second one is global shifting dynamics. The third one is new age leaders. And the fourth one is new age organizations. And all these four will impact your profession and your life in immeasurable manner. Talking about the disruptors, two important things that are happening are one, technology, and the second one is sustainability. Technology, as you know, it describes every part of our life today. No technology, no life, it appears. And the pace at which the technological changes are happening, it is difficult to keep pace with it. To give one example, many of you may not be aware of the basic mobile telephone that we started with in the 90s because most of you have come into life or existence when, when smartphones were already on the canvas. So this basic phone, it was the Nokia which was the leader. A company from Finland which was more into electronics, paper, got into mobile world. They built the first telephone, mobile phone, because they were able to foresee things and they became the leaders. But then they became complacent. So much so that they were not able to see the full picture and kept focusing on the shape and size of the phone, the hardware component. They forgot that the new generation, generation Z, that, many of, that you all belong to, is looking for something else. So meanwhile, other companies like Apple were able to foresee the changes in the demography, the tastes and preferences, and they built their own mobile phone with its own operating system. And that smartphone, and many smartphones have come thereafter, they simply pushed aside this Nokia. And Nokia had to fight hard to try and come back, but it had not fully succeeded. All this has happened just within a span of 10 years. That means the technological changes that will happen will simply bypass you if you are not all eyes and ears. Sustainability, of course, you know, the whole world is under its influence, negative influence. The emission of greenhouse gases has begun to impinge every sector of the economy, whether it is agriculture, or the secondary sector, the industry, or the tertiary sector, the services. Rather, these sectors have been the cause of the emission of greenhouse gases, and now they are getting it back. So how do we create a new civilization based on new economic models where we are able to have sustainability? It's very important for you to remember here that Mahatma Gandhi said that this nature and this earth that we have inherited, it is not the inheritance from our predecessors. It is an asset that we have borrowed from the posterity. The nature of the earth that we leave behind will matter for the generations to come. So every generation has to be so responsible as to leave a better world for the next generation. 
And the second shift I was talking to you was about the global shifts relating to economy, geopolitics, and demographics. We are aware how the Asian and African continents have now begun to emerge. So if the economic indicators are showing better performance this side compared to the Western world that dominated the 19th and the 20th centuries, obviously there will be also changes in the geopolitics. And we've already started seeing the geopolitical changes and the power centers possibly shifting to Asia in due course of time. And that is going to be during your lifetime. So you have an exciting time ahead. But more important is the demographic shifts that are happening. We have certain countries ruled by the aged and therefore they are becoming non-productive. But countries like India, now dominated by the youngsters, will continue to dominate at least up to 2050 and therefore an opportune and propitious times lay ahead for our country. But the character that you need to understand as professionals to be is this Generation Z. Post World War, we had the generation called the Baby Boomers. Large population was required across the world. There was peace after a long time. There was new technology, new awareness growing on earth and large number of babies were given birth to. Now, next generation, what is called Generation X, born between 1965 and 1979, is now past the prime to which all of us belong. Then we have the Generation Y, born between 1980 to 1994, who are now in the prime of their profession. And then the generation, generation Z that you belong to between 1995 and 2010. The purpose of sharing this with you is that you need to understand the sociology, psychology, tastes, preferences, collective consciousness of these respective classes. Generation Y is characterized by certain notions of the past and of the future. They are reasonably responsible. They are reasonably members of a team. They may not have been born when technology was booming, but they are open to technology. And Generation Z, born after 1994, has never been offline. You are all born rather with mobile in your mouth. And like the silver spoon that we should talk about. The characteristics of this particular generation <coughs> are that they are loners. They are not such team members <coughs> as the previous generations were. But they are responsible in a different way. That responsibility is that they want to make changes. They are not seeking profits for the sake of profits, but they are seeking profits for the sake of a purpose. So that is a positive side of the new generation. So you will be dealing with these kind of sectional characteristics. So when you go to rural India, you will have to keep these things in mind. So. When you get into enterprise of your own or of others, whether within the government sector, within the corporate sector, within the non-governmental organizations, or of your own, you will be facing similar sociology, similar psychology and economy. Wherever you are, whatever you are, as I said, this human life being the most beautiful of life with one distinguishing factor from all the millions of other species on earth 
and that is a cognitive power. The ability to think, the ability to discern, the ability to delineate the good and the bad. So that desire, aspiration is so very strong in the Homo sapiens, not that it's not there in other species, but it is very strong and it is expressible here, will create a desire in you to achieve excellence. So what is excellence? So your aim in life to be excellent, that's what I want to tell you this day. Can you become an excellent person in your life? So if you want to be, what is excellence? In common parlance, excellence is to be highly distinguished, better than best, better than others, being unique. Only when you are that excellent, somebody looks at you, or you look at yourself more positively. But then the meaning of excellence can vary from person to person. For a student, it may be to get the highest grade possible. For a teacher, it may be to give the best of teaching. For a doctor, it may be to respond to the highest number of patients. But for a student who wants to score the highest, what means he is he or she deploying to achieve that excellence is very equally important. Are you going to read well, understand well, and score the high marks in a legal manner, ethical manner? Are you going to copy and do that same thing in an unauthorized manner? Likewise for a doctor, does he want to just see patients or does he want to cure the maximum of a patient at very low cost in a very healthy manner? So the meaning of excellence itself can vary. If it is so, it means that it is a double-edged sword. Excellence predicated upon your sincerity and hard work will take you where you want to be. But you may suddenly realize at that point of time, before you have even realized that you arrived there, that you have arrived at a wrong destination. So all the sincerity and effort that you would have put in to achieve that excellence would leave you gasping for breath at that point of time because you see that, my God, where have I arrived? The reason is, excellence for a human being is not isolated. It is in a social context. Man is a social animal. So you would also desire that your excellence is recognized. You desire that it is accepted. It is celebrated. But nobody is going to celebrate some corrupt person who has achieved excellence. Nobody is going to celebrate somebody who has achieved wealth by committing theft or burglary in somebody's house. Nobody is going to celebrate a person who has marauded the wealth of the nation to become a rich man. So if you want social recognition and acceptance of your excellence, you need to do something else. That means you ultimately want fulfillment. And that fulfillment is possible when you are looking at your body, your mind and soul in togetherness. And that alone is going to create what is called an inner balance. The wealth may give you a lot of external balance, external satisfaction, but it will never give you inner balance. That inner balance called homeostasis is what is the real good health of a human being on earth. How do you recognize that good health? That health is linked to de needs, desires. So, some of you must have read about Abraham Maslow, an American psychologist who propounded his new theory in the beginning of the 20th century. The need hierarchy theory. He was able to recognize and delineate the different needs and he gave a hierarchy of needs which meant that to move to the second need you need to fulfill the first one and so on and so forth till you 
arrived at the fifth need which is supposed to be the most sublime need of the human being. We begin with what is called the physiological need. We are animals to begin with. We need food, water and many other kinds of physiological needs. They need to be satisfied. Then you move to the safety needs. You want security, safety of ourselves, of our family for example. Then third one, you move to what is called belongingness and love. Once you are, sad, you are sure that you are secure and safe, you want to have the love of your friends, of your parents, of your family, intimate relationships as you grow up, they are equally important. And then you move on to what is called self-esteem. You want recognition, achievement, success, whatever that mean, mean to you. But that self-esteem becomes important. And then finally, you cross all these things and go into what is called self-actualization. That means there, you are doing something not for purpose of any of these things, but you are doing it because just you love doing it. You are trying to harvest the full potential that innately exists in you. It may be just reading, it may be just painting, it may be just running, it may be just walking, it may be just climbing up the mountains or simply going and serving somewhere or simply meditating. That is all self-actualization. So you move from one need to another need. So as you are moving up, you are possibly realizing your innate potential and becoming a better person. But as you are traversing the path towards this self-actualization, you will be facing large number of challenges. Life is beautiful, but simultaneously it is always not a bed of roses. A rose also comes along with a thorn. But then that is the beauty of life. If life is always one of laughter, then you will not know what is laughter or happiness after some time. Life, whether in the physical world or in our own personal life, is a relative term. I'm happy because I was sad yesterday. I'm today seeing the day light because it was darkness preceding this. So everything has to be measured in terms of relativity, not just Einstein's theory of relativity. But what it means is, and before I tell you that, I just want to quote, as I keep quoting many a time, one of the very beautiful lines from Vincent van Gogh's biography. Vincent van Gogh, a Dutch painter, who died at a young age of 37, who was not able to sell a single painting during his lifetime. Today his paintings are celebrated world over, and each painting costs millions of dollars. But he met failure in every aspect of life during his lifetime. So one of the sentences that I can't forget is that a person who knows not what is sorry in life has no story to tell. Remember? A person who knows not what is sorry in life has no story to tell. So if you want to create stories in your life and cherish those stories and then share those stories in your old age with your children and grandchildren and others. You must create stories. And when you want to create stories, you will fail. Not necessary that you will succeed all the time. But when you are facing faced with failures, you need to be resilient. That's the word I want to share with you. Resilience in agriculture is very common. We keep saying we want climate resilient agriculture. <laughs> but we need in life also resilience. Resilience simply means that when every circumstance is stacked up against you, you are still not bending. You are still not wearing a self-sympathetic card on your chest. You are not crying for attention. You are saying, I can face this. And that is resilience. 
So you would need to acquire a lot of resilience in life if you want to try something new. A baby which does not want to fail cannot walk. So if you want to walk in life, you will have to acquire the capacity to face failures. But then you can negotiate those risks provided you want to be and are willing to be resilient. So where does that resilience come from? So we said that you, know, you need to be excellent, you want to be excellent, but you will face problems in life as you are walking towards excellence. And therefore you need resilience. And those road, the milestones on the road map have been given by Abraham Maslow. You could of course put your own specific milestones. What it ultimately means is that resilience will come from another source, not necessarily from material source, it will come from an intangible, immaterial source, something that we call transience. So you should be looking at that. In this connection, I would like to quote another book, some of you or many of you may have read because it's one of the best sellers currently. The book is called Ikigai. Right? How many of you read? Oh, see, I can see so many hands up. So others who are not read, please read. You will take two days to complete it. <laughs> right? I hope you are all following up with me so far. Not gone to sleep? Have you all gone to sleep? No. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Because you don't have that luxury, unlike those on the virtual platform. They can sleep, of course. <laughs> All right. So, I was talking to you about Ikigai, many of you have read. So, that particular book, which talks about a purpose in life, or the ways for a long and happy life, that's the purpose. That's not the purpose, but that's the outcome to have a long and healthy life. So this particular book written by two authors, Garcia, Hector and Marcella, and Francisco, sorry, based on research, they take you to a small village called Ogimi in Okinawa County of Japan, an island village, where they find that largest number of centenarians are there, and some of them are super centenarians. Centenarians are those who live 100 plus or near 100 and super ones are living beyond that 110, 120. And mind you, genetically, the potential of a human life is 135 years. So you can live 135 years, provided you live that way. So don't be surprised that somebody is 110, 120 there, no. So what, are this, what is that secret to such a long and happy life? Four simplest things they talk about. One of course, a balanced diet. And one secret, sub-secret of that is don't fill your stomach to the full, eat only 80%. When you feel you are nearly completing your hunger, though your taste bud is saying the gulab jamun is tasty, let me take one more. You have to say no. <laughs> of course, gulab jamun is our generation, so you might talk of ice cream or whatever it is. <laughs> right? So, balanced and moderate diet. The second one is regular exercises. Of course, you need not take yourselves to the extreme of testing your strength and stamina. Regular, moderate exercises unless somebody is trying to become an Olympian. And the third one is very important, which you should practice. You all come from different parts of the country. Community living, building relationships. And the fourth one is having a purpose in life. Your purpose in life may be for some of you to keep this campus clean. If I see any paper, shreds of paper, some undesirable solid waste, I'll pick it up and then dump it in the 
uh, waste bin. It's a very simple thing, but it can be a passion. Somebody's purpose in life may be to go and visit a home meant for the disabled or the challenged. For somebody else it could be something else. But you need to have a purpose in life. So this book, Ikigai, these authors say that these are the four reasons why the people in this village of Ogimi in Japan are able to live happy and long. And they found that there are four other such blue ribbons where there are super centenarians. They are in California, Costa Rica, Greece and Italy, small places here and there. But then you now understand that you need a purpose in life. And how do you know what is your purpose? So another psychologist, Victor, his name is, he says, if you do not know what is your purpose, your mission is to discover that. So please use these two years to discover your purpose in life. And you may not be knowing so far, but now use this beautiful, salubrious environment to discover your purpose. And sooner you discover your purpose, longer the time period you have to fulfill that. What if I discover my purpose at this age of mine? I have very less time to live to fulfill that. Maybe maximum 30 years, 40 years. But you have 80, 90 years ahead to fulfill your purpose in life today. So sooner you discover, better is it for you. Now why do you need to discover this purpose? Is it just to live long? Is it just to remain happy for yourself? There are many trees on earth which are 1000 years old. It can be simply vegetative life. I can live for 100 years. But if I have led a selfish life, unknown, unrequired by anybody, when I die, the people heave a sigh of relief, oh the old man has gone. Is it the purpose? We are not in a race. We are here to find the meaning of life. Therefore, this purpose has to be beyond the self. It has to be required for somebody else. It has to serve some other noble cause. That's how I started with great people like Sadar Vallabhai Patel, Mahatma Gandhi, Vargis Kurian, Tribhuvan Das Patel. Right? That's how they are worth being remembered today. So, your purpose, if it is to be resilient, I talked about resilience. So now you need to understand that there is a close correlation between resilience and this purpose. The nature of your purpose will determine the nature of your resilience. If it is a selfish one, I don't think so you will be able to sustain that onslaught of natural and external calamities that will visit your life. Because you are not going to find any support from others. But if it is going to be social cause, you will find support system. First it will emanate from within because it is a larger noble cause. And second others appreciate and therefore they will stand by you. So that purpose will have to emanate from three words that I will want to share with you. The first one is empathy. Second one is compassion. And third one is altruism. These are the three things that will embellish your purpose with broader meaning and greater nobility. So what is the meaning of each of these? We keep using these words in an exchangeable manner. We use them commonly but we know they mean something good but we don't know what specifically they mean. So empathy or to begin with compassion, compassion is to suffer together, that's the meaning. You and I suffer together, that's compassion. 
But then it starts from empathy. Empathy is based biologically in what's called as mirror neurons. That means it has got some physiological root. When I am performing, let's say, I am walking on a tight rope, I am feeling something, I am seeing my own performance but I am either scared or I am having some particular feeling. If I see you walking the tight rope, then also I will have the same feeling. What happens to this young boy? Would he be able to traverse it rightly, safely or would he fall? That anxiety is created in me. So there is a mirror image of each other. Your feelings are mine, my feelings are yours. So there is a neurophysiological root to the common feelings that you and I are two human beings or one animal and another human being share with each other. That's empathy. You are going on the roads of Anand, you see an accident. You feel, oh my God, what may have happened to the person there? That's empathy. But somebody is so hard-boiled, thick-skinned, his entire feeling system is hinged. He doesn't bother. He just passes by. That means he has no empathy. But is empathy enough? We have many people with empathy. <laughs> right? Everybody wants to look good. Oh my God. But a truly empathetic person goes forward, further. He takes the next step. And that is, he develops a desire in himself to do something. When you saw from your own vehicle that a car has met an accident, you feel that you should get down, help that person. That means you have taken a step forward now. You are feeling into thought, thought into action. So intention has become an action. So we need empathy compassion and altruism to serve and that will be the true purpose. So if you look at the life of all the people I mentioned, you will find that they were not resting content with writing papers or making speeches, but they were ready to tease their minds, challenge themselves, soil their hands and then do something for others. Otherwise, India would not have been number one in the milk production since 1998, for 20 years. So, you need all these three things. When you have these, automatically your purpose of life would be beyond gardening and making your house look good. Gardening is a good hobby, is a good purpose too. In fact, many in that Ogimi village have gardening as their purpose in life. But then, are you just gardening to make vegetables for your kitchen or you also want to share it with somebody else? When you find that next door neighbor is poor, can't afford to buy vegetables, you share your vegetables. That is altruism. You make more vegetables, you say, oh, okay, I, I did not eat today but I will go and give it to that home meant for the old age. That is altruism. So at individual levels, simple level, we can be sharing in common ways, but somebody who has got greater capacity will transform the, the societies. So that's a different matter. Whether at small level or at large level, you need to be compassionate, you need to be altruistic. So when this happens, automatically your resilience is there. Your resilience will take care of the challenges that come in life. And that will enable you to cross over the hump and reach that excellence. And that excellence that you arrived at is not a selfish excellence. It is not a socially unacceptable one. It is very much socially acceptable and cherishable destination. So you have to find that kind of a destination in your life as you are here. So as you do these things, I would like to uh, recite one, put one particular, uh, you know, what is called as one of the very prayers. It's not a prayer, it is just a uh, you know, message that is very beautifully contained. So it, it, it is called as, it is written by somebody called Renor. It says, God, 
give me the grace to accept the changes that cannot be changed. So there are many things in life. You may not be able to change them. So God, give me the grace to accept those things that cannot be changed. But going forward, he says, give me the courage to change those things that should be changed. That means you are not supposed to give up. Okay, give me the courage to change the things that should be changed, no matter what comes to me in life. And third one is, give me the wisdom to differentiate between the good and the bad. So that's the final thing, that you are asking for grace of God, along with your own need to put in your whole life into that. So I don't want to leave you on a fatalistic note. I just want to say that we have not understood the entire life so far. We know a lot of things are within our capacities. But there could be certain factors outside that. Therefore, have conviction in yourself, in your own capacity to make a change, and simultaneously have the humility to believe that there are certain things that you cannot control and therefore you will believe in that extraordinary power which you may call nature, destiny, God, but preferably we call him or her as God. So I'm sure that these two years of your stay here under the inspiring heroes and heroines who have made this land will continue to inspire you every moment and you will be guided by your teachers. A teacher is a guru in our culture. Teacher is somebody who may be purveying information, building your knowledge. But when you start looking at that person as your guru, then he or she becomes your guide and mentor. And I can tell you from my own experience that a good guru will continue to guide you in his absence all through your life. You'll remember their certain advices which you may not understand the full potential at that moment but you'll realize it later on. Because that advice comes from wisdom. Wisdom comes from experience. Experience has come from life's engagement. You may be very intelligent, but you, you are sans that experience. And that is the experience of the Guru. So you must learn to respect the Guru and engage with him or her. Draw the maximum that you can. And these two years would be the period of life which you will remember for all times. From here you may go on to do so many more qualifications. You may go for your postdoctoral, doctorate, so many things. All said and done, more or less for the first time in your life, you would be interacting with people from different parts of the country, from different backgrounds, different profiles. So this cultural cauldron that you will be uh, experiencing and taking the tasting the flavor of it is unique so build good relationships build trust in one another be a good human being and will naturally be the best professional so thank you very much to all of you so thank you very much let me uh, thank my young friend Dr. Vakan Dash for inviting me here and giving me this privilege of interacting with young minds like you and it has been a pleasure being with you all. Take care. God bless.
Thank you, sir. With your permission, uh, we'll take a few questions. We, uh, we'll start with a question that came to us online. Uh, that's from uh, one of the senior batch participants uh, who's now entering her second year and is on her internship right now, Ms. Shivani Mishra. The question is related to migrants who come from rural areas to the urban areas in search of uh, better means of livelihoods, all the while missing their ba homes and their lives back homes that they had. How do we, the rural managers, so to say, ensure that the urban economy is kinder to them? How do we do that? Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, yeah. Yeah. This is a very uh, sensitive issue that we have not been able to create enough jobs in our rural area is resulting in distress migration. There are two kinds of migrations. There is also a migration for better opportunities, for education, jobs because you are capable. But then distress migration is something that we all need to concern ourselves with. People for an, a kind of a job. So the greatest focus according to me is that we need to focus now on building skills of the people in the rural areas. In the urban areas when they come, there is already an enemy. As you know, there is a concept of called anomy, right? I think it was Durham or some political scientist who talked about anomy. That means indifference. Everybody becomes anonymous. The collective moral of helping community living gets totally dwindled in urban areas, particularly in the corporate in the corporations. Where everybody is caught up in the crux of his own life. No time to stand and stare. So who is bothered about what is happening to the other person? So certainly today, not just in urban areas, even in rural areas, generally as a society, we now need to start refocusing on human values. So there will be two approaches. First is of course the government has to focus on creating some kind of living environment for these people. Today when they come, where do they live? There is no fixed place. So we need to start building large number of colonies which are rentable, which are, you know, shareable. So we need to start building those kind of accommodations. Of course, we still have not built houses where they should be, but doesn't matter. Along with that, we also start to need to start building this. We need a mobile safety net. The meaning of mobile safety net is using digital platforms. We are able to transfer the safety net provisions for two to three months. When somebody exits an industry, for example, under a golden handshake or he is being exited because the industry is not able to run, then he is given three or four months of support system. So I think all migrations should now become channelized, regulated. If somebody is migrating from a rural area, there has to be a record that I'm leaving. He records himself, registers himself with the Gram Panchayat or some authority that is transferred to the urban authorities. It's all possible today using digital technology and there will be no duplication. So a person who is migrating from rural area to urban area, who should be having at least three to four months of hand-holding social safety net. And during that point of time, using his skill that has been imparted or the skill that may be imparted to him, he will find some kind of a job. So which means that we cannot just leave the people to fend for themselves, but we need to have a system of regulation. And given that we have today, for example, one nation, one Russian, one Russian card, you go anywhere in the country, your Russian due to you in Gujarat will be available to you in Haryana or in Karnataka. So I think digital platform using the power of JAM as they call now, Jandhan account, then the mobile number and the Aadhaar number gives us an opportunity to track and trace and deliver the goods and services and benefits that are due to a person. So that's what we can do. 
if the family is entitled to public distribution system based ra ration at the village, if one person is migrating, we can transfer his share based on the digital platform in the village, in the urban center that he's going to live. So this is just one example. So I guess there are many ways of uh, doing it. And as you know, the, the, the ramifications that we had, adverse ramifications we had during the corona time, where people had to migrate back to the rural areas, government took a very uh, good decision of uh, now building housing colonies in the urban centers so that these people can come and stay there. So many a time these adverse situations also give rise to uh, positive initiatives. So there's a, there's a lot to do, but I can only tell you that welfareism that is pretty strong in India, which is now getting more and more accurate in its delivery, thanks to the digital platform. Supported, of course, by Aadhaar number, which helps you to track and trace the person. And the use of uh, the penetration of the, uh, you know, internet and the spread of mobile uh, sets. Uh, I think we need to make it more powerful uh, the, uh, in due course of time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We invite uh, questions from the audience. Yes, please. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, sir, my question is, uh, there is an extension of urban areas encroachment, matlab. so there is, uh, where we now in see, we see agricultural land turning into non-agricultural land. We are making more colonies. And so how we are going to deal with this extending urban areas and reducing rural areas? Thank you, sir. Yes, that is certainly an issue. Now today, India, let's say, has got 329 million square kilometers of geographical area. It is the seventh largest on earth as a nation. But unfortunately, our density of population is very high. And generally, the ratio of usage of the land is supposed to be one-third in favor of agriculture, one-third in favor of forests, one third in favor of all other purposes that includes habitation, common property resources like pasture lands, etc., etc. And that is so in many countries. Unfortunately, in India, a higher 46% of our geographical land is under agriculture. 140 million hectares. And this is the highest ratio anywhere on earth. Because of this, the area under forest is only 22%. While as, the, as per the forest policy, we should be having at least 33%. And then we are left with very less land for other things, which we call as waste land, pasture lands, water bodies and all that. Between 2000, two, three to 2000, 11-12, as high as 1 million hectare of agriculture land was denotified for non-agriculture purposes. Increasing habitation, infrastructure, industries, non-agriculture purposes. We will not be able to stop this because India is still in need of better infrastructure. Habitations, whether urban areas or rural areas, then we need to create job opportunities outside agriculture sector because agriculture cannot absorb more people. As it is, it is too heavily loaded. We need to shift people from agriculture. So there is going to be diversion of agriculture land. But the policy is that as far as possible, we should not be divers, diverting agriculture land. We should be looking at non-agriculture land wherever available for that purpose. And where it becomes inevitable, we divert non-fertile lands. All said and done, in reality, it does not happen. 
what is therefore required is a land use planning comprehensive land use planning a comprehensive land use plan will give us a road map as to use the land in the best possible manner second one is we now need to start going vertically in every domain whether it is habitation whether it is in agriculture everywhere we need to start going vertical what's the meaning we stop people from having building horizontal houses we make it very costly for them we only promote incentivize building vertical spaces likewise in agriculture you will all learn in economics that land is inelastic it cannot it can increase but we can impart it vertical elasticity that means a piece of land one acre of land instead of using once a year i use it three times a year by using new technology appropriate technology so my cropping intensity goes up by three times right so one acre now becomes three acres gross area becomes four for me we need to start being innovative in urban areas for example you see a lot of space that is wasted how do we go for terrace gardening how do we start building vertical systems gardening for example peri urban agriculture every inch of land should be utilized to just give an example i as a student remember having read a report of some de uh, delegation that had been to china it was then a communist china what they were doing in order to first meet the requirement because there was terrible shortage like in our country and more importantly not to waste things the school children during their free time if they had one hour of free time or it was a it was a scheduled free time they were all told walk along the railway track after the train carrying the coal has moved and collect all the coal cinders that may have fallen isn't it because open track uh, trains are going then they would leave the ducks in the field after the harvesting is done so that the grains are collected so don't waste things since you asked this question i want to use this opportunity to tell what many of us would be doing as they say every grain saved is one additional grain grown world over fao has calculated estimated that the food loss and waste is of the order of 15 to 30% sometimes 40% there are two kinds of you know wastage that happen one is what is called as ethical waste other one is the technical waste technical waste is after the farmers have harvested we are not able to carry that to the market in a safe and secure manner poor handling poor storage poor transportation poor harvesting practices a lot of food gets wasted we don't consume it in time food gets decomposed right milk for example its life is 4 hours we do not pasteurize it it will go waste so you need good agri logistics to ensure that there is no food loss but food wastage is ethical that means we do not eat all that we have taken that is a ethical waste so in western country generally ethical waste is very high in asian and african nations technological technical waste is more <laughs> we are not as much as ethical waste both of us need to learn to make up for our own respective weaknesses so if india for example 2015 our survey showed that because of poor agri logistics 
the extent of food wasted was of the order of rupees 93,000 crore. And that was a very conservative estimate. That means we had not captured the wastage that happens at all the stages along the value chain. So 93,000 crore was 10% of the 11 lakh crore of agricultural GVA of that year. So instead of trying to promote 10% additional growth, if I save that 10%, I have done the same thing in a more efficient manner. I have not utilized the resources that are being utilized. So this is how everywhere we need to start looking at. Okay, and more systematic planning. Our cities are growing haphazardly. Therefore, there is a lot of wastage of space. We need to be having strong urban management. Our urban management is still not as good as it should be. We need better capacities and better systems and better regulations. You know, we all take pride that India's Indian civilization is the oldest civilization, the oldest continuing civilization, okay? There are some who are supposed to be older than us, but they have not continued. But Indian civilization has continued to this day, beginning with Harappan and Mohenjo-daro. And that Harappan and Mohenjo-daro civilizations are based on urban management. <laughs> you know, they are the best of roads, best of drainage system, best of, you know, common bath. I don't know where we lost all that, you know, knowledge <laughs> and all the things and we have made our whole thing in urban slum, you know. So I, I think we also start need, need to start looking at that. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. First of all, thanks for the inspiring speech, sir. Um, my question is, uh, please, as we have asked us all to... Excuse me, can you please get up? Yes. Sir, as we have asked us all to find the purpose in life, I mean, how do we do that? Is it a thought process that we have to think all the time or is it an uh, activity-driven process? How do we do that? You see, it's not an activity-driven approach. I just said that if you are able to consciously inculcate in yourself the value of empathy, compassion, you will automatically also develop your purpose. Now, that purpose will possibly arise from becoming self-aware. I am not asking you to become a sannyasi to become self-aware. You know, in your normal life, you must start practicing meditation. Yoga, meditation, these are very good. What is yoga, of course, it, it, is, it is both physical and mental. It calms you down, gains you clarity, because it declutters your mind filled with many other nonsensical things. When your mind becomes clearer, obviously, its, it's, it's natural inclination is to think of the good. So when you say meditation, you can be sitting here meditating also. Meditation is not trying to check your thoughts. They say that on an average, 60,000 thoughts pass through your mind every day. You just, you, you observe yourself. So many thoughts are, you know, sometimes you think of mother, sometimes you're thinking of father, another time of, you know, pizza to be eaten in the evening. You know, some, so many things. So, Buddha says, meditation is not to check those thought flow, but to become aware of those. Just keep on observing yourself. When that awareness is there, you will automatically think of doing something. This is the only way I can suggest to you. At a practical level, of course, I would advise you to one, read books and to listen. When you start reading books of different people, in, including biographies, you will get an idea as to what they, how did they develop their purpose in life. It is a search. 
And when you listen, say to your teachers, itself will give, give an idea. So at a very practical level I can suggest that you must develop the habit of reading. <coughs> now, reading on internet for example, for your research and other kinds of things, it may be necessary but it is not going to give you the depth that is required. Because all of it may not be there fully and it may not be there logically. If you are reading a published work on Kindle, it's all right. But you must read books, particularly I would advise you to read autobiographies and biographies of great people. For example, when I read Varghese Kurian's I too have a dream, had a dream, it is a, it is a biography. As told by him, it has been written by the authoress. You get so many ideas. You are inspired, motivated. Okay? So, read. Listen to your gurus, great people. And simultaneously, at a personal level, I told you, do practice, you know, yoga and pranayam and meditation. <coughs> these are all not, uh, what the, these are not, not, uh, not something to ask you to go out of life. See, that the beauty of Indian culture is different people have told different things. In fact, people like Swami Vivekananda in the you know, 19th century or even Madhvacharya in 11th century, they said you can be a samsari, you can be in your life and also become a, uh, you know, a, a yogi. Okay, they, you, are all, you, you may be thinking, I'm too young to learn all these things. No. Sooner you learn, better it is. <laughs> okay? So, you can find, you, you, you do yourself, you have to find your own purpose based on these stimulus that you'll get from outside. Okay? You will get it. You just start thinking that I want to, you'll find it. To just give you an example, Vincent Van Gogh. He had to change his job so many times before he discovered that his purpose is to paint. He started as a pastor. He was trained as a Christian pastor. Okay? He jumps from one place to another because he was not finding comfort with anything that he was doing. Till one day he says that my purpose is to paint and he did not know how to paint. He starts learning to paint. Okay? So, that is a discovery. Okay? So do that. Can you please pass the mic? Kushi, Kushi. Kushi. I'll take your question after that. Uh, hello, sir, and it's a privilege. My name is Kushi. Uh, so my question is that recently we were sent uh, as a part of our field work uh, to introduce two villages nearby, nearby in Gujarat. So I saw one thing in particular that was the female or as in general students were very ambitious there. Some wanted to become CA, especially the female side was very sincere and everything. But somewhere I also felt that, uh, you know, in further, that they were not motivated as much or uh, they did not have a clear vision. Uh, they just knew that, okay, we had to become this because this would give us a better livelihood. So my question is that how do we uh, overcome this disparity of uh, actually you know, granting them the perfect thing and especially in the case of females, uh, they are really drained about the work that they have to do and they feel very less motivated. How do we as managers come over this disparity? Thank you. Yeah, I think what you are asking is that they have a dream but they don't know how to fulfill it, right? Yeah, it could, one thing could be that they don't have good examples around them. We need to create good number of examples, good number of leaders. As soon as we hear the name leader, we think of somebody at the national level, at the state level. No. Everybody cannot become a Mahatma or a Marx. We need leaders in our communities. We need leaders, for example, among you. Somebody who stands out for purpose, 
of on basis his his ethics his morality his nature to work hard to help so we need larger number of such bright examples in villages so that fervor has to be created so now you as professional managers can be leaders by your conduct by your willingness to proactively help somebody one of the i mean three of the important features to excel are that you are proactively aware first thing is you are proactively aware of the society around you and what they are second you are proactively planning to make a change and third one is you are working consistently towards that so you will become a leader by yourself to give an example in 1986 i think i read in a newspaper there was somebody there was a particular village in kolar district of karnataka in that village as elsewhere you know that during those days there was a lot of exploitation and there was a particular section of this village which was into prostitution and uh, people from outside would come there including officers who were exploiting this women so there was one young boy who was posted there as branch manager of the rural bank you know that we have got gramin banks right so this boy he took it upon himself see now he had empathy that this woman is being exploited he was compassionate he wanted to do something then he now set out to do things now you might say how he set out to do as a branch manager he had the power to give loans to people to develop small micro enterprises during those days we had scheme called irdp integrated rural development program it was a self employment program so he now trained them motivated them to buy buffaloes cattle or start some small business and said now you have an avenue here you please stop that so he took into confidence the family the village elders and told them this is a bad reputation for the for the village and they slowly transformed themselves and i also read that next time somebody came he was tied to a tree and shamed a shame you know put to shame so the grateful people named that village after him his name is basuraj yes, man is so a boy who came from some rural area who must have just studied some graduation from some non descript college and became a branch manager of a small rural bank and he was able to transform so there are inadequacies they'll say that system is full of problems but who is going to change so we need not have a debate as many people do system versus individual individuals have to change the system yes the collectively the government or the society will be also transforming the system like creating greater opportunities for literacy education and all that giving them economic empowerment but as individuals what change can you make you should think and you can do it is individuals who have thought that i must i must make a difference who have been who have who have been able to do it and create examples for others so your colleague will get inspired that if she could do there why not i so we need to create this islands this pools of excellence and then connect one excellent center with another excellent center okay so this is what is the way to transformation you can be a change agent you can be a change agent i forgot i i should not tell you a bit when i told you that the your generation or the 21st century when i was talking about new age organizations and new age leaders a new age leader is somebody who is compassionate a new age leader is somebody who is 
wanting freedom to do things. He doesn't want to be bossed over. A new age leader is somebody who is thinking of system of systems. That means he's building platforms and platforms. How do you connect your platform with her platform? Take mobile for example. Today it does so many functions. When we started with mobile we had just only could listen and talk. But then today it is a torch, it is a time uh, alarm, it is your note keeper, it keeps your contacts, it does so many things, right? So system, systems and systems have been integrated onto one platform and each is independent. So likewise you need to, yeah, as a new age leader, you need to start building systems and systems of systems and then Capture, uh, capture them as in platforms, okay? So you will make a change. We'll, we'll take final two questions. One would be from the gentleman right there. If you could please pass the mic to him. Good afternoon, sir. My question is like, uh, um, among the farmers, there are uh, um, a lower variety of uh, uh, marginal farmers and small farmers and uh, a marginal number of uh, large farmers. And the government is providing subsidy on a uh, greater scale to the smaller farmers. However, the Brittonwood structures is interfering in the subsidy scheme to suppress the government that no, the subsidy you are giving is creating an imbalance in the international scenario. So, what is the government of India's approach towards this problem? Like, what is what is their view? They are adopting top-down approach or bottom-up approach. Uh, what what is the government's view over this? Yeah, I, if I could uh, just uh, make a precise of what you're asking, is a debate around subsidy support, right? Since you're all concerned with rural management and agriculture is a very important segment of rural management. Let me tell you that agriculture anywhere on earth is difficult to be profitable. Okay, let us start with that premise first. Agriculture is highly vulnerable. It is subject to several externalities which cannot be controlled because of dependence on climate which is worsening because of climate change, production is always uncertain. And because of poor post-harvest agri-logistics system and also because of the inability to control demand and supply, price fluctuations are very normal. So there is a risk, right? If there is a risk, naturally there is higher probability of loss of production and loss of income. Risk is innate to every enterprise, including car manufacturing, there is a risk. But those risks are more manageable compared to risks in agriculture which is dependent on nature. Therefore, support of government will always be necessary. Second, in India where 86% of the land holdings are small and marginal, with average holding 1.1 hectare, the risk becomes that much more complicated because the scales of economy do not operate. Input management becomes costlier. Transaction at marketing becomes that much, of cost, that much costlier. So in India, agriculture is more difficult than say in the United States where average holdings are 1,000 acres. Here it is 1.1 hectare, right? Now should we be supporting them to sub, uh, with, with, uh, this, the welfare package or support, you know, production support? Yes, we should be. What we are asking is, how do we make it more efficient? There is no doubt that our delivery of subsidies or delivery of support system has to be more rational and has to be more accurate. When I say rational, that means I give it to those people who deserve the best. I give it to those regions where it is more required. 
For example, should I say, should I give it on wheat today or should I give it on bajra? Should I give it a rain-fed farmer or an irrigated farmer? Should I give it a large farmer or a marginal farmer? These are rational issues, right? Which can be always debated and a proper decision taken. And then, how do I deliver it efficiently and effectively? Is by using digital technology as government has already begun to do. Today with the click of a mouse, we are able to transfer thousands of crores under PM Kisan to the rightful farmer, right? Corollary to this today is, do you have a price support system or an income support system? These are the two ways of transferring subsidies. A price support system means I give subsidies on the kind. If today it is 1000 rupees for 1 kg of a particular seed and a farmer cannot afford to buy it, I tell him all right I will give 500 rupees subsidy okay, and you buy at 500 rupees. I may be giving it on say uh, mustard or I may be giving it say on wheat. So the other farmers who are growing not wheat but not mustard may not be getting it. That amounts to little irrationality, right? Because I'm not giving on every seed. So this is called a price support system. Or at the post-harvest stage, I procure wheat and paddy but I don't procure, you know, let's say, ragi or sorghum. So the sorghum farmer feels I'm not getting benefit. The wheat farmer is getting coming from the same kitty of the government. Both are children of the same government. So somebody may feel left out. Therefore, people are these days saying, can we have income support system? Which means, I transfer the cash uniformly or based on certain criteria, of course, to all the people. Let them decide what they want to grow. If my agriculture officer tells me that this area is good to go Brajra, I'll grow Brajra. If somebody says it's good to grow cotton, I'll grow cotton. But then the amount of money being sent is fair. So that is the debate going on these days. Price support versus income support. So maybe we are slowly graduating towards income support system because today it is possible for us to transfer that money in a systematic manner, transparent manner, objective manner. And it is also possible for us to capture more accurate data on the farmers, farmers' fields, crops, so many things. It's possible today using proper applications. It was not possible earlier. So there were certain innate difficulties in doing all that. Not that all the time governments are not doing their job. Governments also have their own constraints in a vast and complex country like this. Okay, the so systems are improving, certainly, for, there's no doubt about it. And we are moving towards a better and more transparent system. So I want you to have a good feeling. Don't have, have a negative feeling that, you know, everybody is bad. No, there are both bad and good people. But system improvement will take care of 60 to 70 percent of transparency. So I believe that ultimately, the you know, honesty in professional delivery of service is a function of two things, system efficiency and individual ethics. We must first look at system improvement so that there is less discretion for the human intervention. There is less scope for human discretion. So the systems are taking care of these things. Then individual ethics is the next one. It is easy to ensure that to, through moral lessons and through enforcement. If the whole dam is cracked, we cannot control the flow out of irrigation. If there are cracks here and there, we can always check that. Alright? You understood, I hope. Right? But individual ethics is very important. That you must try to be that bright example of honesty and integrity so that you create ripples around you and more and more people become good. Okay? okay. Last question. Uh, at the back. George.
policy makers actually take the consensus of the stakeholders, especially people who have a low voice in society when it comes to policies that are coming up. And if yes, what are the steps as a bureaucrat that you have taken on your side so that such things happen? Yeah, this is see, a very good question and governments have always been focusing on participatory approach to policy making, participatory approach to designing of programs and implementation. You will find that in every scheme we always say interact with people. So under the 73rd and 74th amendment to the constitution where we have set up decentralized Panchayat Raj institutions and urban local bodies in under 74th amendment, there is scope for, not only scope, it is, a, it is required for interacting with the people. Under the Panchayat Raj institutions we have the Zilla Parishad, the Taluk Panchayat or the Gram Panchayat and the Gram Sabhas. So, Gram Sabhas are the associations of the people directly, where large number of development programs, rural development programs, the action plans for that is all discussed in the Gram Sabha. Then it comes to Gram Panchayat and goes up. Okay? So, let us say implementing watershed program. The guidelines will always speak about you know, the committees of the people. So I'm just giving you a few examples to show that a large number of platforms have been created through the programs and the guidelines for people to interface. When you say policies, it's a very larger issue. Let us say a policy that leads into an act passed by the state legislature or the parliament. Right? Now, how do you get the people to inter interact there? What does government What does government do normally? Suppose I am writing a policy on, say, marketing. The draft is prepared by a committee, which is composed of members representing different sections, state governments, for example, other stakeholders. And that draft is then hosted on the website. It is sent to the state governments and other kinds of you know, stakeholders. When it is on the website these days, it is possible for anybody and everybody to also give a comment. So that is a participatory way of preparing a policy document. And from there it will go to the cabinet, I mean minister, cabinet and the parliament. So you see, there is so much of rigorous process that is there. And in a democratic system, in a vast country like India, you cannot be discussing, I mean it is very difficult to discuss everything with everybody. But the people's representatives are supposed to be carrying the will of the people. So whether it is MLA at the state legislature level, the member of parliament, they are representing the will of the people. So this is an indirect democracy. In history you have read about direct democracy in, in Greece. There were small Greek cities small population at that point of time, 2,300 years ago, where it was possible to discuss everything like this, right? But in complex environments with so much of population, we will have more of indirect participation. However, I think once again the digital platform is giving us an opportunity to have more and more of direct participation. So when that document comes on the website, it is accessible to everybody. But how many of them take interest in reading is a question. Not every citizen can read it also and not necessary. But at least those direct stakeholders who are supposed to be reading should read it. <laughs> and we, you know, we, we don't find we, uh, all the time that is happening. But yes, it is the, it has to be participative approach uh, is important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for being so gracious uh, with your answers. And so, I now request and invite Professor Pratim Modi to the dais to propose the word of thanks.
thank you so much, sir, for extremely inspiring and very interesting uh, Siksha Aram Vyakhyan, uh, wherein you have defined the excellence for the new generation of rural managers. I'm sure this speech will also inspire all the students of the 43rd batch of PRM to explore or find the purpose in life. Honorable Chief Guest, Respected Chairman Sir, Director Sir, Invited Guest, Participant of IRMA's programs, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good Afternoon. It's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. I, on behalf of IRMA, extend hearty thanks to our distinguished speaker, Respected Dr. Ashok Dalwai, Chief Executive Officer, National Rainfair, Area Authority, Department of Agriculture and Farm Welfare, Government of India for delivering this extremely insightful and topical address. His address, I'm sure, will inspire the students to be empathetic, to be compassionate and address the issues of rural development with greater empathy. We couldn't have had a better start for this journey of rural management for the 43rd batch of PRM. Our deep sense of gratitude to the Chairman Irma Shri Dilipurath, esteemed members of the board Irma and dignitaries for taking time out for attending this event. I thank the Office of Director Irma, my faculty colleagues, staff colleagues and participants of Irma's programs for their active participation in this event. I also thank those people who have joined virtually for the Siksha Aram Vakyan. Thank you everyone and wish you all a great day ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us here today uh, uh, in person and of course virtually. I would now request uh, Dr. Makatash to please escort the Chief Guest out of the auditorium and I request everyone to please be seated. Thank you. Thank you so much.